Come with me now to a deep place of deadly quiet, where a treasure awaits you far greater in value than any coin or gem that has ever been hewn from this earth. Come, claim that greatest of treasure, knowledge. In other words, I'm gonna show you how to make some books today. Welcome back to Wylock's Armory. Let's go to the crafting table. Okay, producing tons of tiny books en masse, quick and easy, but no two alike. I began with some cereal box cardstock and some graphics medium chipboard. Chipboard is the grayish brownish thick slab you'll find at the back of a legal notepad, but you can buy it in bulk like I do if you want. There's links in the video description below. Anyway, I'm gonna cut a thin strip of this chipboard, maybe three or four millimeters wide. Very thin, multiple passes with the knife, nice and clean. And then from the cereal box, or whatever thin cardstock you're using, cut a strip that's twice that width, plus a little more to account for the spine. Now the technique in a nutshell is to cut a small sliver of that strip, and then fold it in half and glue the chipboard bit in between. I use super glue because it's instant. You can also do an open book by taking two of those chipboard bits and gluing them on an unfolded portion of that cardboard. But that's the basic idea. What I wanted to do was mass produce. I do not have the time to make hundreds or thousands of these little books. So, first I super glued the chipboard strip to the food box cardstock on the shiny product side, very important. And I really pressed down for 30 seconds, moving my fingers along, revisiting to make sure it really adheres and is cured. You could use white PVA glue for this, but I did not have the patience. Then need to fold it over by using a sort of rolling action to cinch that, that turn around the spine that the cardboard is making. And once that's been pre-folded and sort of trained where it needs to go, super glue the other side. Now with some big strong scissors like kitchen shears, just start lopping off a few millimeters at a time. These are books. Make some taller and some shorter. Now I did find this was very difficult to work with. The cereal box cardstock is a little too thick. It's also multi-ply, so it would delaminate because it's such an intense fold. It's a very small fold. So I switched to Manila Folder, which is a considerably thinner, more lightweight cardstock. It's kind of close to printer paper, but I'm, I'm guessing anywhere in the world that you are, you've seen a, a Manila Folder. So that sort of thing. Anyway, doing the exact same technique there. Super glue the chipboard strip in, fold it over, and super glue to complete. Then lop off some books. I pre-calculated how many I needed. It was something like 300. Then take like six to eight base colors, you know, a red, a green, a blue, a yellow, etc. Six to eight base colors and just slather on a good solid base coat. Don't need to do two coats. Just divide up all the books you made roughly by sight into six to eight piles and give them each a base coat. You could use craft paints for this. I'm using Army Painter paints. Incidentally, Army Painter is one of Wylock's Armory's new sponsors, and they have provided me some product, but I guarantee never in a million years did they think I would be using it on a bunch of tiny little books. Not miniature heroes, books. Now to begin the no two alike, we're gonna use washes. And again, I recommend Army Painter. I've been saying this for years, even before they became a sponsor recently. I do believe they make the best washes in the game. Beautifully vibrant, rich, not oily, and just wonderful to work with. And here's the principle. Some wash colors work well with multiple colors. For example, a dark brown wash is gonna look good pretty much on anything. So I'll pick maybe three or four books from each pile and those are gonna get a brown wash. blue. Look at the top two piles. That light blue and the teal and then the dark blue pile down below. All of those would work with a blue wash. So I'm going to pick some more books out of those piles. Those will get blue. Red. Red can go on the dark red, the tan, the orange. So I'll take a few books from those piles and give them red. Now here's another thing that's gonna make the Army Painter folks probably cringe in their seats. To save even more time, I got sick of painting each one individually, so I just sort of held them in my hand and slathered some wash on there and shucked them around with my fingers to get them quickly coated. I want these books to look aged and beat up, so I don't need or want a cleanly applied layer of wash or shade. And then I thought, you know what? Why am I even bothering with a brush? Let's go for it. Let's get dirty, let's have some fun. Because Army Painter comes in dropper bottles, the way paints should be sold, I could just douse these with a few drops, shuck them around in my hand, boom, Insta Shade for 15 books, five seconds. 
Now I set all of these out on a small silicone mat that I have so that they wouldn't stick. Wax paper would probably work as well. And then I mix them all up, mix them all up into one mass. There are some repeats in there, but now we're gonna solve that. We're gonna divide the whole pile into three piles. On one pile, I'm gonna take a metallic silver, this is plate mail by Army Painter, and put one to three stripes along the spine of the book. Mix up the positioning and the thickness. Then I'm gonna take a gold, Army Painter Greedy Gold, and do the same thing for the second pile of books. One to three stripes, varying position, varying thickness. The third pile gets nothing on the spine. Then with a parchment color, and I did switch to a cheap craft paint for this, paint the pages with a very fine brush. You can slop it on there in one very thick coat. And remember, most of these are gonna be on a bookshelf, so you only need to do the top of a side. You don't need to do along the long side or the bottom because they won't be seen. So this goes pretty quickly. So my trove of ancient books is ready, and now it's time to mount them. I'll cover how I built the furniture in a few moments. But first, this, uh, this isn't rocket science. A strong bead of white PVA glue, such as Elmer's, along the shelf, and then with some tweezers, or your fingers if they're very slender and dexterous, mine are not. 25 years of drumming and labor has left them proudly beat up and calloused. But anyway, you put the books in there, and yeah, it's looking pretty sweet and mix it up. You could stock a full shelf, maybe half of it with one leaning on the end. I'm gonna stack two books on top of each other here. Maybe you have an open book. You can get away with not having to make so many books by not stocking all the shelves all the way. It's also visually a little more interesting, but you do you. Now, as I'm watching this, I count about 15 books on that top shelf, which I'll tell you right now is about two inches wide. So there you go. Seven to eight books per inch is how many you're gonna need to make. I'm also gonna throw a couple of scrolls on here. I did those a few videos ago. I'll put a card in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Yeah, all right, so these are looking pretty good. Let's talk about the furniture and some permutations thereof. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. The most basic bookshelf can be made easily with nothing more than popsicle sticks. You can get a thousand of them in a box for like six bucks at any craft store. It so happens that if you lay five of them together, it's just about exactly two inches. So cut 11 two inch segments, five of them form the back, four of them make the shelves, and the last two are for the sides. Glue them together with the glue of your choice. I'm using super glue for speed, but when gluing wood together, I recommend white glue. Applied carefully, wipe away any excess with a wet brush. Otherwise, it'll cure in place and the wood won't be paintable in the next step. Once again, returning to the knockoff dollar store Jenga blocks. I've also got two larger size jumbo popsicle sticks. One of them is an inch across and the other is three quarter inch. They tend to be thinner and they cut easily with a few passes of a good utility knife. Now, as it happens, three of these large size put next to each other is the same width as that Jenga block. So not thinking much about it. I just made like, I don't know what it is. A combination desk, shelf, hutch, I don't know. But it's the joy of five minute craft woodworking. Chop up pieces, glue them together, and so on. Oh, one tip. If you do use white glue, well, really for whatever glue you use, you want to build it up to a thick bead, undiluted, wherever you have a joint like this. So if you're attaching the, the cut exposed edge of one of these wood paddles to anything else, you want to build up a lot of glue there so that it bridges the gap. I also find using needle nose pliers or tweezers to insert the shelves is helpful. How about a desk? And I'm just going to let this play. I mean, you can look at the thing and it's kind of self-explanatory. It's just more different sized popsicle sticks cut up and glued together in a certain way. I will say, don't be afraid to use a little bit of hot glue in areas that won't be seen. Hot glue cures very quickly, so it's helpful just as a small tack to hold two pieces in place that are attached with a better glue like PVA or super glue. Also, don't be afraid to try some angled cuts. They make things more interesting. That's a fairly decent standard old desk, but I just wanted to sort of keep messing around. What else was in the drawer? These oval pieces, tracing one onto another to cut out a circular notch. This is where the person would sit. And again, multiple light passes with the knife. Well, not light, it's a moderate amount of pressure, but you don't have to go crazy. Multiple passes and then a bit of sandpaper at the end. Curved wood cut. For the backing, I tried to bend one of these jumbo sticks, but it was it was not going to happen. So instead, I arranged some normal popsicle sticks, attached them together with a thin strip of cereal box cardstock, 
use that oval as a curve trace again to cut out sort of a neat curved backing. This will be like a wizard's desk or think the enchanting table from Skyrim. And once again, not afraid to use hot glue in places where it's never going to be seen. When you're doing miniature stuff like this, Legs are very difficult to do with any sort of durability, but by simply attaching them in a T shape like this, or even an I beam, you suddenly have two axes of control, and it will be much, much stronger. I'm painting these with my usual wood kit that I've been really into the past year or two. Just very watered down acrylic craft paint, slathered on there, and then wipe away the excess, much like you would with a real wood stain. Use two different shades of brown for a complex, rich wood look. Oh, you know what? I got one more idea. Let's make a drow ritual table. Look at these. Plastic Halloween vampire teeth. And I've got more of those oval wood bits. I'm going to take one that's about the right size. For the plastic teeth, I prime them, as always, with God's gift to humanity, Rust-Oleum 2X Flat Gray. Then painted it black. Yes, you could just spray prime it black, but I find that gray spray primers work the best. I just prefer to start with them and paint from there. Some more Army Painter paint. This is a purple. I'm going to water it down and apply it just like I did my woods earlier. Although this is ugh, it's a little bit rich. Uh, yep. Uh, luckily, I can just flip it over and do the other side. So water it down a little more. And there we go. That's the consistency that I want. The wood grain gets exposed and you can still clearly tell that it's wood. It's just been tinted. Now while it's drying, it's time to measure out some art and glow, or whatever epoxy resin of your choice. I'll mix this up and add some red ink. Maybe add it a little too much, and in hindsight, I basically, really, I probably could have just poured in some red paint for this step, but whatever. Careful, careful surgical decanting. The idea is there will be these four reservoirs of blood in the table for the experimenter to draw from as needed. Color contrast is looking good, I like it, but this needs a little more. I put some black ink in my airbrush and gave it a gradient, sort of like a burned edge around the perimeter of the oval. But it still needed something more. So I got out my Warhammer 40k water slide transfer decal sheets. The Eldar one is a good source for arcane looking runes and stuff. Plus they're space elf, so it kind of goes with the drow thing. I liked this touch. But then I went and ruined it. See, I put in a light purple and tried to give it a halo like it was a glowing purple rune, but all it really did was dull it down and hide some of that great purple wood grain. I regret this. So I took white paint and repainted over the symbol. And while that was drying, I prepped some DM Scotty style candles. Plain wooden toothpicks with hot glue teased along it, except for the last two or three millimeters and then attached on with hot glue. The blob of hot glue at the bottom is simply the wax that has collected due to melting. I also found some of these old red potion bottles that I had put together. Again, I did a video recently on how to make potions. I also added on some scrolls, painted the candles, and then what we're all here for in this video, books. Then I figured this is a drow ritual table. Surely it should be aged in. I wonder if we can get some blood spatters. So by loading a brush with some dark red paint and then flicking it with the finger, you can get some pretty effective blood spatters. Then I shaded the candles with flesh wash. Army Painter flesh wash is a great, rich sepia type of wash tone. It still has some color, some pop, some saturation when it dries, unlike the strong tone and the soft tone. And a few more books and then I called it done. And this was a nice little surprise. It's funny how your afterthoughts, not your planned work, turn out to be the things that you like. In fact, I liked it so much, I revisited my old furniture and put some runes on those as well. Remember the art direction in Witcher 3? There's like paintings all over everything. And it's generally just a very colorful setting. Kind of like that. Which of these little pieces today was your favorite? Leave a comment below. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not afraid of bold colors. It's just the way that I like my stuff to look. On camera here, it kind of looks cartoonish and blown out. I will say at the table, these tiny miniature things three feet away with the human eye don't look nearly so bold. It's really a nuance of this DSLR zooming way, way, way in. I struggled for years with what I felt was sort of dull looking terrain and miniature features for my D&D games. And what it took me a while to learn is that 
you can't be afraid of color. So if you're feeling that way about your work and you're trying to figure out why, well, that's the answer. Don't be afraid to use a true red or a true blue. It's gonna dry more muted than you think. Also, when you wash it down, it's going to be darkened heavily. Now, this video you're watching here is the fifth in my series of Back to Basics Dungeons & Dragons miniature crafting tutorials. Check my backlog and my playlists from my main YouTube homepage. And feel free to click the like button and check out my Patreon and use my Amazon affiliate links and all that stuff. But more than anything, make sure you keep your hands busy. Be making something. It's really fun. Once again, a huge thanks for Army Painter. Kind of a strange video to use their products in, but I can tell you I have a few videos coming up that are gonna feature, first of all, a forthcoming product they have that I'm very excited about. It's nothing particularly revolutionary, but it's just done really well. And it's basically gonna be the ultimate gateway for brand new wannabe crafters. And then another video, I have some truly epic models to put their products through their paces on. For those of you new or newer to this whole scene, you can usually find Army Painter racks in any friendly local gaming store that carries any sorts of paints. And hey, if you want an alternate way to support this channel, check out my published D&D modules. They're very cheap and distributed digitally. Links are in the video description below. If you haven't already, be sure to join us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. 40,000 members strong and growing. That's 40,000 people like us making miniature stuff to enhance their tabletop gaming. Be sure to take pictures of your work and post them for all of us to see. Thank you very much for watching today, and until next time, I'm Wylock. Make things and play games.